Welcome back to the All Turtles podcast, a show about the future of work, the future of health, and entrepreneurs building the future with tech like AI. I'm John C. Fuentes, co-founder of All Turtles. Today, I'm interviewing Renee DeResta. Renee is the technical research manager at Stanford Internet Observatory. We had Renee on the show last year talking about Russian election interference, and today we're discussing how she's tracking the spread of coronavirus-related disinformation online. So I'm joined here, uh, sheltered in place again for another episode with Renee DeResta. And Renee is the technical research manager at Stanford Internet Observatory, which focuses on the study of abuse in current information technology. So we talked to Renee about a year ago, and Renee investigates the spread of disinformation online, which is a specific thing. She's advised Congress, the State Department, and other organizations on disinformation and state-sponsored information warfare. Renee, thanks so much for joining us. Great to be back. Did I capture that correctly? Uh, Yeah, I've been at SIO since I think June of last year, so just coming up on about a year now. I can say very briefly, like we work on kind of three main things. We look at proactive detection, so looking at how you identify misinformation and disinformation campaigns, so looking at narratives online. Uh, we look at forensic analysis of, um, you know, when Twitter does a big takedown, the data set becomes public a lot of the time. And so we'll participate in that process in, in putting out uh, preliminary findings uh, on those data sets, what's in them to help inform the public. And then we do a lot of policy work also, which is as we study this problem and as we understand how it manifests, not only in the U.S., but uh, globally at this point, what are the policy considerations that countries need to be thinking about Uh, related to the information ecosystem of today. Has the nature of the work changed at all since we last spoke? I I think we we had you on around February of last year. So coming up a little over a year. And at the time, we were really focused on Russia and Trump in particular. And I just wonder how how that narrative's changed and how we're kind of on to new ones now. (laughs) Uh, Well, so then when you and I spoke, that would have been, I think, uh, so it would have been February 2019. So that was... A couple months after we put out some research on the internet, well, not at the time I wasn't at Stanford, but I uh, and some other teams I was on had put out some research on the Internet Research Agency. So, yeah, a lot of it was focused very much still. This was before the Mueller report was out, I believe. And so, yeah, a lot of the focus was still on how did Russia interfere in the election and what should we think about that? Following that, I did some work on the GRU, which is a different uh, Russian entity that involves a little bit more in the way of uh, hack and leak capabilities and ways in which the leaked content then is kind of put to use in service to disinformation. So ways in which you have this kind of uh, full spectrum of capabilities that certain states have at their disposal. And then, of course, where we are now you know, beyond elections, uh, Stanford, we've done a bunch of work on different elections, Taiwan, Poland, Libya. But one of the areas that we're really focusing on now, of course, is coronavirus, since that's what everybody wants to talk about. Uh, That's as we're all sheltered in place, narratives around everything from the emergence of the disease to uh, treatment modalities, to conspiracy theories, to, you know, government responses. What what are government responses look like worldwide? And how should we be thinking about getting good information uh, kind of in this time? Right. And and everyone's calling this in you know, an unprecedented time because the pandemic's just unlike anything we've really experienced before, but people have questions for this. So, so where are the places people are getting information to answer those questions right now? Yeah. So there's still the, of course, broadcast media is still huge, particularly for certain older segments of the population. Uh, you know, there is still a lot of people who turn on their nightly news and, and watch, uh, you know, watch, watch television there's talk radio, which is still a huge source of information for a lot of people, uh, newspapers. And then, of course, all of these channels also have presences on social networks. And so social networks are this interesting hybrid where you have this broadcast media ecosystem that also maintains a social presence. So you can see some of that content reaching audiences who are consuming it primarily on the Internet. And then there is also this very peer-to-peer kind of communication ecosystem where information is moving from person to person. So that's a little bit different. That's that's one of the areas where, of course, you used to do that 
in your neighborhood, at the coffee shop or at church or whatever. Um, but that dynamic of person to person sharing of information is now kind of wholly divorced from geography, right? We can do that with people anywhere. Um, right. We can be on a Zoom together from anywhere. And so that dynamic of, of how people get information through their social platforms, through their social channels uh, is something that we're very interested in also. Just what does that peer-to-peer spread look like? In part, because those are really networks where people trust the other people in them. Like they feel like they found, you know, these are the like-minded, the people with whom they have some sort of camaraderie or, you know, we all kind of joke around about like internet friends, but <laughs> you do in fact spend a lot of time with the people who are in Sure. The Facebook groups or WhatsApp groups or uh, online communities that you're part of. So, I'm really interested in uh, dynamics around that. What is what is socially generated information look like uh, in the age of a pandemic? Because that really shows you what regular people, what everyday people are reading or consuming, and then are taking and bringing to their communities and sharing with their friends. And, and this is what we'd call, you know, in the cases where they're sharing information that's, you know, in, incorrect or unethical or dangerous accidentally, we'd, we'd call that misinformation. Right. Whereas it, it sounds like there's what's potentially scarier is this, you know, very purposeful disinformation that props up around specific topics related to coronavirus. So we see a little more of the misinformation, you know, well, a lot more actually just in terms of prevalence. Misinformation is interesting because there's a dynamic where, a lot of times in the person to person sphere, especially people are just motivated to share something because they really want to help their community. So if they see something about uh, a cure, right, even if it's a hoax mm-hmm. cure, even if it's something pushed out by grifters or somebody with, you know, where the kind of ulterior motive is bad, the people who are sharing it are doing so because they genuinely believe that they've found some sort of information that's going to help their friends and family stay safe, right? So there's some good, real altruistic motivations there. The problem is with the platforms in particular, what do you do about the underlying grifters and the underlying kind of people who are telling you drink colloidal silver, you know? And then of course, there's the other problem, which is what happens when the thinking out loud, just speculating kind of stuff comes from the president of the United States, (laughs) as we saw last week. With this, what if oh, yeah. there was some sort of disinfectant or, you know, UV light that we could Gosh. use, right? Where, you know, there is there is somebody somewhere who's doing some sort of research that is tangentially related to that. Um, but there's also a, a degree of uh, the, the challenge of how quickly information spreads. And in this particular day and age, like, you know, it's it's not necessarily going through a very rigorous vetting process. So a lot of our prior thinking about health misinformation has really been this idea that the authorities will communicate good stuff to us, right? Because they know what to do. Uh, Even with Ebola, right? Ebola is not new. A a new variant might emerge or it may emerge in in a pocket of a country that hasn't experienced it necessarily before. But there's still treatment protocols. There's still an understanding of the disease. Uh, there's still a body of research that authorities can draw on to say Uh, this is what you need to do. And measles, again, the same thing. There are measles outbreaks constantly, but when the World Health Organization or the CDC says, this is what we do about measles, that's based on decades of research understanding that disease. With COVID, it's been very interesting because so much of the speculation has come from authority figures because nobody knows what's going on. Right. Is there a way to do that ethically? Is there a way to share information as it comes up that could be relevant or important? to the general public, but, you know, might not be fully vetted or. There are some really fantastic science communicators on Twitter who are, you know, and <laughs> embarrassingly right now I can visualize their avatars and I'm going to have to like pull up my Twitter feed <laughs> to, <laughs> to actually pull up their handles. Um, but epidemiologists, virologists, a couple of people who were uh, in the last, in the Obama administration who worked on, on outbreaks and dealt with Ebola and a few other things who sit there and just kind of, very, uh, in very kind of like plain spoken, jargon free terminology, walk people through the latest findings, right? This is the latest scientific finding right. digested for a lay audience, which is a thing that I think is a, it's a phenomenal communication skill that, uh, you know, unfortunately our institutions haven't really prioritized. You don't get right. that from the CDC and the World Health Organization. 
Um, so when you have these people who, who, you know, kind of take the time and, and get out there on Twitter, these, you know, even emergency room physicians who just get on Twitter and say, this is what we're seeing in our hospitals. This is what the, uh, you know, this is, these are the sorts of things that are playing out in the, you know, on the front lines of fighting the disease. I think those perspectives are incredibly valuable uh, to deliver to people. This is one of the things that social media is so great at. And so I know Twitter in particular has been trying to quickly go through and verify, you know, give blue checks to some of these doctors and epidemiologists and researchers who are out there explaining what exactly is going on. One of the um, really exceptional communicators with regard to the vaccine development in particular is uh, Dr. Peter Hotez. Uh, He's always out there on Twitter, really walking people through, you know, he's developed vaccines in the past, works on, I believe, tropical medicine. And he will walk people through an explanation of this is why it's hard to develop a coronavirus vaccine. This is what is unique about coronaviruses. Mm -hmm. This is how the vaccination development process works. Here's what the testing is going to look like. Here's what we can plausibly expect. So that's where, you know, again, you're getting it firsthand from experts in real time, as opposed to previously, 20 years ago, if this was happening, you would have maybe gotten that in a snippet on the nightly news. But it, you know, that that dynamic, that kind of direct communication with experts is a really interesting thing to be witnessing as the world tries to understand what's happening. And of course, if there's going to be a legitimate expert talking about vaccinations online, then there's going to be a community of people morally and radically opposed <laughs> to this. What's going on with yes. like this over? It's and I, I am not a conspiracy theorist. I don't understand how or why this content gets pumped into my feed. But what, like, what is going on with Bill Gates with cell phone towers? <laughs> like, there's like there's like yeah. giant. There's these series of overlapping Venn diagrams of crazy right now that I'm having a hard time parsing, and I'm wondering like, wh- where's the origin for some of these? Yeah. Well, so there's a couple of things there. First, conspiracies are generally correlated. So there's, you know, we, um, there, the, I think there's a study and I'm not going to recall off the top of my head uh, when it came out, but the greatest predictor of belief in a conspiracy theory was belief in another conspiracy theory. Um, and mm-hmm. one of the reasons for that is because it indicates a particular alignment or worldview really rooted in distrust. If you distrust the government on fluoride, you're going to distrust it on GMO food. You're going to distrust it on vaccines. You're going to basically any communication that comes from the government, you are kind of predisposed to believe is suspect. Uh, Ergo, that's why you'll see that, um, you know, oh, I'm just challenging the official narrative, right? That's what the state wants you to think kind of, uh, kind of alignment. And one of the things that we started seeing back in 2015 was ways in which anti-vaccine activists, um, in particular, we, we, you know, kind of fought this battle to get a law passed in California, eliminating vaccine opt-outs. And during that political fight, you really saw a lot of the um, the same people who, you know, people who believed that vaccines caused autism, believed that the government was covering up the fact that vaccines caused autism. And so a lot of the outreach that they did was to people who believed different government cover-up stories or who were... Uh, kind of anti-government and, you know, ultra-libertarian in general, right, believed that the state had no right to tell you what to do, period. And then in some extreme cases, the sort of sovereign citizen movement, the conspiracy that, you know, the U.S. government doesn't really exist, isn't, you know, is a corporation. I'm not even going to go down that whole rabbit hole. But but that's where you, you see a lot of these groups that maybe kind of, again, we, we talked about social media helping you find your people a little bit earlier um, again, you, you so you find all of your people who share this belief with you. You all hang out in the same Facebook groups. And so there's this kind of constant reinforcement of this particular worldview. And so what happens with Gates in particular is if for a very long time, he's funded a range of research projects for years and years now. And you would see basically any time there's any outbreak anywhere, <laughs> Zika in 2016 had Gates conspiracies. Ebola had Gates conspiracies. There was the idea that the person who is researching the treatment or talking about the inevitability of a global pandemic has somehow engineered that global pandemic to profit from their research projects, right? So he invests in companies <laughs> that develop technology or vaccines. Ergo, you know, there's this this kind of trace back. And so with this particular one, 
what you see with Gates has been uh, last year, a study came out where some researchers he'd funded had been thinking about the problem of how to, uh, how to preserve immunization records in countries with poor record keeping, not much in the way of digital infrastructure. Mm-hmm. And one of the things, one of the experiments that they were looking at was uh, kind of like a quantum tattoo, right? Something where when yeah. you know, a new modality for receiving a vaccine that would also put these little, and I am not a physicist, <laughs> um, but the idea was that it would also kind of inject the skin with something that could be read near field uh, using a phone, basically. So effectively, the mark of the vaccine is part of the vaccine itself. And so there's no need for record keeping. This is not visible to the naked eye, but you know you could check with a device uh, immediately in the near field to see if the person had been vaccinated. And that turned into there's microchips in the vaccines and the government is going to track you if you get them. And this pandemic is really just a vast plot uh, to get us all vaccinated using the new Gates microchip vaccines so that the government can track us. Right. So you have these sorts of like, um, you know, again, there's most conspiracy theories. There's some teeny tiny kernel of you know, some facet of it that is valid in some way, right? So yes, does Gates fund vaccine research? Yes. Did Gates fund research that was looking (laughs) at this particular process? (laughs) Yes, right? (laughs) Those two things are true. Ergo, you know, this nonsense about microchips and whatever else uh, is also true, right? And that's that's not how how the real world works. But one of the things that's appealing about conspiracies is, they frame the world in terms of some nefarious power with greater control than you kind of pulling the strings. And so what that means is you are not out of control because you, you know, you can't control the situation. It's that someone else is actually secretly controlling it. And so you are, you know, you're kind of like a victim of circumstances it's been really interesting to see state sponsored conspiracies coming out around this also because again with this battle between China and the US on where did the where did the uh, virus originate in China you know while the US has this narrative about the Wuhan laboratory over in China right. the conversation is whether US soldiers brought it over during the world military games and whether it was oh. developed at Fort Detrick right so again there's the same kind of parallel to they did it on purpose and it got loose or they did it on purpose and they brought it here and it's a bioweapon. And again, in China, that's playing very well for the communist party because as people believe that they're in some way, you know, they're to some degree indemnified from responsibility. This is not a thing that originated in this country. This is a thing that those U S soldiers brought over and did to them. Right. And so, again, there's that you're being absolved of responsibility. There's these nefarious dark forces outside of your control that are involved here. And so it's been interesting to see in this particular pandemic ways in which states are actually leveraging these conspiracy theories for geopolitical gains as well. Are there ways for organizations like yourself to track the origin of some of these stories? Yeah, that's that's one of the things we do at Stanford Internet Observatory. Um, so we've put out our blog is uh, io.stanford.edu, and we have written about the Chinese, you know, kind of Chinese COVID origins. Uh, so we've got two posts up there by Vanessa Moulter, one of our graduate students, and she's, you know, we have a number of ways that we track things. Uh, some of it is. We use tools like CrowdTangle, uh, which allows us great visibility into what's happening on Facebook. Uh, Mm -hmm. We do a lot of open source intelligence, you know, OSN type um, methodology to look for interesting links to other platforms and, you know, where narratives emerged, kind of tracing it back. And then we also look at what communities it hops to. So how does a particular piece of content, whether it's a URL or like, you know, what we call an engram, like a, a word or a phrase or, you know, kind of series of phrases. How do those narratives spread across the internet? And sometimes it's organic, right? Sometimes it's just people, again, sharing because they want to inform their communities. And then other times you see things like coordination, where pages that are not clearly articulating their connection will all simultaneously share the same article at the same time with the same phrasing, right? And so you mm-hmm. can kind of pick up on certain distribution networks that are trying to ensure that a particular message or URL or concept 
reaches as many people as possible in as short a time as possible. Because a lot of the ways that, you know, you, you're kind of deluged with information on the internet, right? There's so much to see. And so either getting something trending or, you know, kind of a keyword, you know, making a keyword begin to be kind of part of the popular conversation are ways that groups of people, whether domestic or foreign trolls, it really doesn't matter. This is the same process, are, are trying to be influential around a particular narrative at a particular time. Now, you've done this work, you know, scientifically with organized research and with researchers and tools. And I imagine you sort of have like a natural filter at this point for when you see a piece of news or, you know, something pops in your feed that you have an idea of the legitimacy of the source or the content. I'm kind of projecting here, but <laughs> that's my assumption. Uh, <laughs> can, can our listeners do like, what can people do to do the same? Like what, what's a, when something comes up in your feed or someone, you know, a family member shares something on Facebook, cause a lot of people are spending time online right now. And, and I, I, I know, I know time on site is up on a number of these channels. What can people do to curate like for themselves and, and how do they ensure that the information that they propagate is sound? Yeah, well, it's really actually. I think it's the it's the sharers thing that's um, the the area where individual people have the greatest leverage, right? Um, mm. It's really hard to sit there and go and and try to do independent fact checks for every article you see, and you know you don't want people to be suspicious as their kind of default mode of operating on the internet. You know, operating from a position of extreme suspicion at all times. I, I talk to people and I get emails a lot, and the number of people who think that someone is a Russian troll is <laughs> astonishing, actually. You know, like, no, I'm pretty sure this, this is a real person. You know? <laughs> there may very well be coordination happening here, but probably it's Americans, and, you know, if you're, if you're in America. So what we think about a lot is how do you encourage people to realize that sometimes content is being shared primarily because of the outrage factor? Mm-hmm. Uh, so even just saying, like, did you read the article? Does the article say what the headline what the headline claims, right? There's a uh, thing that I heard a journalism professor say once, which was, if the headline is phrased as a question, the answer to the question is probably no. So it's, (laughs) which is interesting because I've never actually forgotten that. And, and it's, it's true. A lot of the time it's like, did Joe Biden do such and such, you know, and the answer is usually (laughs) no, (laughs) because if they had concrete proof that that thing had happened, it would have been phrased as Joe Biden did such and such, right? You know, and so there's that that way in which you like just asking questions as a rhetorical device, particularly in headlines, people get excited about it, especially if it's like against their political tribe. And you do see that 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 very uh, identity driven sharing. I'm sharing this article because it increases my status within my community. It reinforces for my community that I have these shared beliefs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but what we you know, what we encourage people to do is think, you know, before you hit that share button, like one, absolutely go read the article, just <laughs> make sure it actually says what the, what the headline insinuates uh, has happened. And then B, it's just, you know, the, the real, the, the other side to think before you share is, are you sharing this because you feel that it adds value to the conversation or the the scope of discussion within the community? Or is it more of like a share out of, uh, out of outrage? And a lot of times the sites that do the most of the sort of share out of outrage writing are unfortunately the ones that tend to play a lot looser with the facts. And so that's where mm-hmm. you see the more hyper-partisan, you know, they've aligned the content in a certain way. They've aligned the claim in a certain way, uh, but it isn't, you know, it, it isn't necessarily as sensational as the, uh, as the headline makes it sound. And so that's where there is really something to be said for for just kind of reading the same story around a few different sites to get a sense of how it's being represented in the media that you're about to share. And Renee, before we close, is there a particularly ridiculous coronavirus <laughs> story that we'd like to squash on the All Turtles podcast that actually is not true? <laughs> Oh man, there's so many of them at this point. Um, you know, the, the, the challenge with the 5G stuff that you raised, right, is um, it's really, it crosses the line into, into destructive behavior. And so it goes, that, that's, yeah, that's the yeah. thing that's, um, that's actually really deeply detrimental. So I, w- I would really say with things like the 5G one, actually go and read authoritative sources to understand why 
so much of that is nonsense because unfortunately the stories that are making their rounds right now are really more about um, people who are concerned setting them on fire in Europe in response. Jeez. So, yeah. So that one's really kind of uh, some of these things, they do have real world impact. I mean, I think that's one of the key takeaways, right? A lot of the stuff, right. even if it starts online does in fact make the leap to, to the real world. And so it's important to be thinking about what we're sharing. Yeah, absolutely. Orne, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, fascinating conversation. Thanks for the work that you're doing. It's incredibly important. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great to chat with you guys again. This podcast is a production of the All Turtles Worldwide Media Empire. We recorded this episode at the Venerable Union Street Studio in San Francisco, California. Thanks to Renee for joining us this episode. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, send us an email to hello at all-turtles.com. Marie reads every message. Thanks to everyone who made this episode possible, including Jim Metzendorf for editing, Marie McCoy Thompson for producing, Chris Plug for his audio expertise, Micah Rivera for our artwork, and Matt Oberman for our theme music. On behalf of Jessica Collier, Phil Libin, and yours truly, John C. Fuentes, and the rest of the All Turtles team, thanks for listening. <laughs>